This podcast is brought to you by Flipper, a marketplace to buy and sell websites, stores, and digital real estate. Plot your own path, become a boss by buying a small online business at Flipper. Simply visit flipper.com slash tech talks for a free consultation and 50% off fees. That's F-L-I-P-P-A flipper.com slash tech talks. If you do visit, let me know how you get on. But now let's get the show started. Welcome to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, where you can learn and be inspired by real-world examples of how technology is transforming businesses and reshaping industries in a language everyone can understand. Here is your host, Neil C. Hughes. Welcome back to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast. And as you all know, I love exploring areas that you don't automatically associate with technology and also uncovering inspirational careers in technology too. And today that search has led me to Think Labs, which is a company founded back in 1991 by Clive Smith. And he's an electrical engineering graduate of Caltech. And the name implies the company's goal. Think deeply about problems that matter and develop imaginative solutions. And Smith has always had a passion for medical electronics, sound, music and signal processing. So way back in the mid 90s, Clive read a paper in circulation indicating that stethoscope acoustics had essentially not improved since the first stethoscope in 1816. And physicians confirmed that even top of the line conventional stethoscopes actually did a poor job of amplifying heart and lung sounds. And here is where Clive Smith's obsession to reinvent the stethoscope gathered pace. In fact, he went on to design the one digital stethoscope. But I want to find out more about that whole journey and how Think Labs never stop inventing. So buckle up and hold on tight so I can beam your ears all the way to Denver, Colorado today. So we can speak with Clive Smith of Think Labs. So a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell the listeners a little about who you are and what you do? Well, I am Clive Smith and I'm the founder of uh, and CEO of Think Labs Medical here in Denver, Colorado. And um, my background is in engineering, electrical engineering and signal processing. And uh, we manufacture a digital stethoscope, which is an electronic version of the most widely used medical device in the world. And I'm glad you mentioned that, because one of the things I love doing on this Daily Tech podcast is exploring industries where you don't automatically associate technology with. And a digital stethoscope, I've got to admit, is something that I would have never have thought of. So can you tell me a little bit more about that and what, what extra it brings to the table? So the stethoscope, as widely used as it is, it's actually quite difficult to use for a doctor. Uh, and it's difficult for medical students to learn how to use it. The, the process of listening to a patient is known as auscultation, uh, which comes from the French um, because the stethoscope was invented by a Frenchman in 1816. And it is very difficult to listen to, to hear patients, especially if they're obese. Um, but generally it can be difficult if somebody's got shallow breathing, things like that. And diagnosing the sounds is not that easy either. The electronic stethoscope provides amplification as a starting point. So the sound is amplified, uh, it is much clearer to hear, and instead of trying to hear a sound that is at the threshold of hearing and struggling to work out what it is, you're hearing it much louder. So you can think of it as, you know, if you're someone who can recognize the type of vehicle that's driving past your, your house um, and you hear the, or, you know, or a motorcycle, it's one thing hearing something that's miles away or, you know, a few streets away and you're trying to recognize what that might sound like as opposed to something roaring past your own house. Uh, you can recognize a Harley Davidson that roars past your own house um, some would recognize it a, a mile away and others would have trouble working out whether that was actually a motorcycle or a truck. And excuse my ignorance here as someone out, outside of the healthcare industry, but is this one of the only digital stethoscopes out there and, and how widely is it used? 
So digital stethoscopes and electronic stethoscopes in general are actually, um, they are uncommon. There are, there are only a few companies in the world that do it. Uh, we've been doing it um, pretty much longer than almost anyone else who's in the business today. Um, there's maybe one company that's been doing a little bit longer. Um, and for the most part, most people still use the conventional stethoscope. Uh, the digital stethoscope is um, is still something that's a little unusual, but that is about to change. There are other things. I mentioned amplification, but there are a whole lot of other benefits that we'll get into that will come into the fore. And ultimately, the way things are going to go in healthcare post-COVID, uh, we expect that electronic stethoscopes will become the norm. That will become the standard. And Think Labs, if just for people that are tuning in and hear about you guys for the first time, is one on the front lines of medical technology. But can you bring the listeners up to speed with the kind of problems that you're solving with technology and exploring new ways of approaching those old problems? So that's a good question. And that alludes to what I was just saying about uh, going into the future and the problems that we're going to solve in the future and why we expect digital stethoscopes, electronic stethoscopes to actually become the norm. Where we are going, as everyone has heard about, is we're going towards remote healthcare, um, keeping a safe distance from patients, patients being able to be remotely monitored uh, in their homes or in nursing homes, all those kinds of things. So, you know, that's where things are going. And those are the problems that we're solving because you can't use a regular stethoscope if you're more than, in fact, two feet away from a patient. As soon as you want to get more than two feet away from a patient, you need an electronic stethoscope because a conventional stethoscope is listening down a set of tubes and the tubes can't be more than a couple of feet long. So if the doctor wants to be slightly distant from the patient or the patient wants to be slightly distant from the doctor in this age of COVID where you're going into an emergency room and you would like to feel safe, and the practitioner would like to feel safe because they don't know where the patient has been. First of all, you can be a little further from the patient when you're listening. In the emergency room, uh, in a situation where there's a shortage of PPE, personal protective equipment, you've got a situation where, um, you know, the doctors were going in and seeing the patient who might be COVID positive. The nurse was with the patient. You've got two sets of PPE. And those sets of PPE are getting consumed on every patient. If you're using an electronic stethoscope, what we've developed is that we've developed the ability to listen at a distance on a Bluetooth headphone, on a Bluetooth loudspeaker. And what emergency rooms are doing with our device is that they're able to say, well, the nurse will be with the patient, but I, the practitioner, will be further from the patient. I will be outside the room. I'll be further away. I'll be more than you know, two meters, three meters away from the patient. Um, I can be at a safe distance and I can still auscultate. I can still listen to the patient. Um, so that's the one distance. There were also people who wanted to use it and have been using it in drive-through testing stations where there's somebody, a healthcare worker, walks up to the patient with their car. They can give the patient the stethoscope. They can breathe. The doctor can be 25 feet away, you know, and, and listen, to the, um, to listen to the patient at a distance. Then we get into telemedicine where you can connect it into a computer, you can connect it into any mobile device, and you can communicate at a long distance. This is where it's all going. I was going to say, one of the things that I've noticed over the last few years is there seems to be a much more reactive to proactive approach to healthcare, where a few years ago, you would wait till you got symptoms and only then go to see the doctor. But now, of course, people are tracking calories, steps, heart rate, sleep, and so much more. But I'm curious, in your world, how are you seeing doctors and patients continuing to leverage new technology for remote medicine? And, and also, what kind of technologies are they using? So... You know, obviously, there's so much consumer technology. So what's happening is a lot of the consumer technology is impinging on the healthcare world. So, you know, in that regard, obviously, on the wellness side, there are all these fitness trackers and sleep trackers and, uh, you know, Apple's, you know, and AliveCore have got these um, atrial fibrillation detectors, which are more, you know, tending into the medical space. 
Um, one of the big devices that that's you know being used out there, which was somewhat new with COVID, uh, was the pulse oximeter, which is you know used for you know measuring uh, blood oxygen level, which has been really critical to you know using that as a warning sign for uh, exacerbated uh, COVID condition. So um, you know medical devices are going further into the home. Obviously, blood pressure monitors. So there's generally a migration into the home. And what we see happening, and it's, it's, it's evolving, it's starting to happen now because of necessity. Um, and so what's happening is that the medical devices, we had the fitness devices for the last few years, uh, which were feeding data, not really to the doctor. It was more the consumer looking at things and, you know, some people being more or less obsessive about the measurements they were getting. Uh, now we're seeing sort of bona fide medical devices that are migrating out of the hospital and out of the doctor's office into the patient's home. So you're seeing the, like I said, the pulse oximeter, the ECG, uh, things like that. Um, even scales, by the way, have got valid uh, and useful, you know, actionable information. If somebody puts on weight very rapidly and they've got heart failure, that can actually be useful. So uh, all those metrics are being done and the stethoscope is uh, you know not a home care device at this point from the point of view of somebody doing self-diagnosis. People don't listen to their own heart and decide, you know, things aren't sounding so good or listening to their own lungs. Uh, but when it comes to doing a remote visit with a doctor, uh, there's going to be a future where the patient's got a stethoscope at home. The doctor can get on Zoom or get on a video conference with the patient, and they can say, you know, I'd like to listen to your lungs. And lo and behold, the patient can have a low-cost device in the home. And they can say, sure, I've got the stethoscope, you can listen. So the doctor will be able to do a remote exam. All these things are becoming much more affordable. And we expect that to just proliferate. And after months of being under lockdown, many of us are starting to venture out into the big wide world again and wearing masks when out in public. But one thing that also strikes me, of course, is none of us have had proper training. And you might think, well, you don't need training to put a mask on. But I mean, for my own travels, I've seen people wearing them below their nose, even around their neck while they FaceTime their friends or after crafty cigarette. I've seen them inside out, upside down. So just to bust a few myths here, what is the proper use? of masks for consumers outside of hospitals and how should they clean and reuse them? So that's not an area that we're experts in. Um, you know, we're on the electronic side and the monitoring side and the device side. Yeah. Um, what I will say is that what we have done as a company is that we looked around the world and we looked at the data and we saw that Asian countries are doing things much better than we are. Um, their, their success rates, their, you know, containment of disease, their, their fatalities, their statistics are just much better than ours. So while I can't talk to your direct answer, I think that that information is, I think people pretty much know that you really need to put it over your nose and put it over your mouth and put it as tightly as you can. Um, and, you know, wearing it as a scarf doesn't really cut it. Um, and you know, there was one picture making its rounds on the internet of somebody using it as an eye, mo you know, to, <laughs> to, to, you know, over their eyes on a flight. Um, so, you know, that kind of thing is not going to, obviously not going to cut it. But what we did was we actually contacted, um, Asian business partners that we deal with in, in select countries. And we said to them, your numbers are really so much better than ours. What do you do? What do you do personally? How are you managing your companies and what are you doing? And we basically got an answer back, which was essentially masks, masks, masks. It was all about masks. It was outdoors. It was indoors. It was all day long, except in the home. They said that the home is a sacred place. When you get home, you should, you know, take off your clothes, uh, put it, put on something new you know, wash your clothes, stay clean, treat your home as a, as, a, as a sort of sterile environment that's safe to be in. But anywhere else, wear a mask. So I think the lesson is, um, you know, we know how to wear masks. And I think, you know, all these other variations, leaving your nose open, leaving your mouth open, all these things obviously aren't going to work. Um, but the main thing is that when you look at the countries, they have a, a mask culture. They don't, they, the mask is not a political statement. It's not a 
positional statement on virility. Um, it's just merely a mask. That's all they see it as. It's just something that you use. Now, I'm not a big fan of the phrase new normal, but I do think we should start thinking a little bit differently about how we all adjust to the changes in a post-COVID-19 world. But what do you think about that? Is there any any changes that you're seeing? Absolutely. This is a major question because, um, you know, we saw such a big change in our business. We saw a big change in how we operate. We saw a big change in the demand for our device, you know, things like that. Um, and we had to try and work out, is this a temporary situation or is this a long-term situation? Is this a new situation or just something that's going to fade away? It hasn't faded away. The I don't like the new normal idea either. Um, you know, I just think it's an evolution. We're adapting. Um, there are all sorts of changes that occur in the world. And we, we don't keep on saying the new normal, the new normal, the new normal about everything. But there are going to be some definite changes. I think from our devices point of view and from the medical practice point of view, telemedicine is here to stay. Uh, Remote monitoring is here to stay. Remote healthcare is here to stay. Um, The the medical ward, the hospital ward is going home. Um, What what we're calling home ward bound. Um, the, The ward is going to be in the home in the future to a very large extent. You know, I'm not saying we're going to have intensive care units in in people's bedrooms, but there's a lot of bedside monitoring that can be done in the home. And we think that that's just going to continue. So, um, you know, there are, uh, people have been anticipating it. Uh, You know, we spoke to people in Australia who were telling us that there's a new hospital being built in Sydney, which has less beds than the hospital is going to replace. So, you know, and, and the reason is that they expect that patients will be more at home than they are you know, in the hospital. And that's been happening for decades, right? Um, People used to be in the hospital for 10 days after an an appendectomy. And now, you know, you go home after a few hours or, you know, you you come around, they kick you out. So, you know, um, that's been a change that we've seen evolving anyway. And so a lot of the so-called new normal is just going to be more of what we've seen evidence of so far. Um, we've seen the evidence, as you mentioned, of fitness trackers and, you know, medical type, uh, met, you know, biometric devices in the home. We're going to see more of that. We, you know, people have been kicked out of the hospital early. We're going to see more of that. Uh, remote monitoring, we're going to see more of that. So I think that the main thing that COVID is doing is it's actually compressing time. You know, what we felt is what normally takes a week we, would, we were getting done in a day. And the changes that we're, that we're seeing as something that we're going to evolve have become step changes. So I think it's really just accelerating the future. The future is happening quicker. Um, on the other side, you know, from, from a business point of view, you know, um, a number of our people are working from home. Anyone who can work from home is working from home. So we've reduced the number of people in the, in the office. We continued running. We were classified as an essential service because we were providing you know, medical devices and manufacturing medical devices. But anyone who could work remotely is working remotely. And we're waiting to see what happens before we go back on that. So that's going to be another change, which is going to be distance, distance working. I think it's not going to be as extreme as it is now, but I think that there's going to be a tendency, to, tendency towards a lot more flexibility there. I've had countless emails from listeners over the last few weeks talking about their fears and concerns around job security while also seeing their interest rates on their savings drop considerably. And as a result, many are beginning to look at how they can invest in their future in an uncertain time. Could digital assets be the answer? Now, you might remember that I spoke to Blake Hutchinson, CEO at Flipper, on episode 1194 about how to buy digital assets and websites. In a nutshell, Flipper is a marketplace that you can buy and sell websites, stores and digital real estate that are just ready to go. So if you do have dreams of running your own successful online business, or perhaps you're looking to exit your existing online business, My friends at Flipper can help you buy and sell. So if you're interested and want to find out more, please visit flipper.com slash tech talks. That's F-L-I-P-P-A 
dot com slash tech talks for a free consultation and also 50 percent off all fees but now back to the interview and i'm curious how, how are you seeing remote doctors leveraging other technologies like the things that you're offering at think labs that is a really good question because most people are seeing telemedicine as a substitute for going to the doctor's office So what they're looking at is they're saying, oh, well, the doctor's sitting in his office and instead of my driving into, you know, this medical office building uh, and going into his office or, you know, now increasingly in the United States, it might be driving to a university medical facility, which is absolutely massive, parking in a parking structure, walking 15 minutes to the right building, taking the elevator up to the, you know, whatever 12th floor sitting in a waiting room with sick people and seeing the doctor for seven minutes. Um, you know, this is great. This is a substitute for that. Um, but from the doctor's point of view to your question, the doctor doesn't need to be in that building. The doctor can declare his or her independence and work from home because now the doctor can basically consult on so many things just remotely and then refer the patient to go for testing. And so we think that doctors are actually going to be liberated by telemedicine. Doctors are going to be working remotely. They're going to be able to, many of them are going to be able to give up their offices to a large extent or have smaller offices. And so we think that doctors are going to see the opportunity. Doctors have fought uh, telemedicine, at least in the United States, from the point of view that there wasn't reimbursement for it. So they weren't gaining anything from it. Now that it's reimbursed, they're going to be liberated by it. And we think that many doctors are going to start doing remote health care. We saw that as well. Again, this idea of accelerating time. We were, we were already working with doctors who were adopting telemedicine as their primary method of practice. So we saw the early adopters and in, you know, along the lines of this compression of time, The future is just arriving quicker. And we will have people listening from a variety of backgrounds all over the world. And just to bring everything that we've talked about to life today, do you have any use cases or examples of the role that you think Think Labs is is playing in a post-COVID-19 world? So the evolution, again, accelerating time, where we're going is, and where where we've been looking all this time, is first of all, we've been in telemedicine for years already. So we're very, very familiar with telemedicine. And what we saw was we saw, the, we saw this step change. You know, everybody's familiar with the idea of exponential growth. But exponential growth is this sort of gradual curve or the steep curve up, you know, towards an increase. In engineering, there's a, there's, a, there's a function known as a step function. And a step function is exactly the way it describes. It just goes from one level to another instantaneously. And what we saw was what we were doing in telemedicine stepped up instantaneously to just, you know, much more. We were doing infectious disease management before. We were involved in Ebola and we were doing that kind of thing. So um, so we were actually very familiar with the whole idea of PPE and keeping doctors safe and medical workers safe from patients who were infectious. So all these things we were doing, we just suddenly saw this step change in the demand and the interest and the the need for this. This wasn't just something interesting. This was urgent. This was saving doctors' lives. Um, So where are we going as a company, as Think Labs? So the immediate thing is increasing the telemedicine we've been doing, serving the home markets. It's been a professional market until now. Think Labs will will move in towards satisfying the home healthcare needs uh, is one area. The infectious disease needs are increasing. Um, And when you start getting into remote care, when you start getting into telemedicine, when you start getting into doctors working remotely, now what happens is that doctors can work remotely from anywhere on the planet. And what we get as a result of that is we get globalized healthcare. And one of the things we know about globalized healthcare is that there's an incredible shortage of the skills needed in healthcare. There aren't enough doctors. There will never be enough doctors to serve a global population in healthcare. 
What is the solution to that? The solution to that is basically machine learning, artificial intelligence, automated analysis of all these devices, the signals produced and the measurements produced that, like the, from the devices we were talking about earlier. There aren't enough doctors to interpret that flood of data. That is already a problem for doctors who are getting flooded with patients who are you know, obsessive about their measurements and calling their doctors to look at all their charts and all their records and all their fitness tracking and all that kind of thing. And the doctors have essentially been able to ignore it. But in the future, with all these home devices, there aren't enough people, there aren't enough humans trained to look at that information. So the ultimate future is going to be these devices in the home, artificial intelligence analyzing these signals, working out when the patient needs to be alerted, and when the doctor needs to be alerted. And that's the future that Think Labs is inventing. And of course, we are all surrounded by 24-hour rolling news channels, and there's a lot of doom and gloom online wherever we look. So just to end on a more positive note, what, do you, what is next for Think Labs? And what is it that makes you hopeful and even excited for the future? Well, I think it's um, obviously we're all very concerned about what's going on. It's a pretty scary um, dystopian time that we're living in. Um, so, you know, I don't want to be, you know, singing something, you know, optimistic right at this moment in terms of we're, we're still in a crisis. Yeah. But yes, long term, the the description that I, that I uh, the, you know, the picture that I painted before is really a much better world of healthcare. Healthcare as we know it is broken. It is not, it, it's not as if, you know, the hospitals are trying to get back to, you know, the status quo ante, you know, what we were before COVID as if that was some kind of a great healthcare system. It was a disastrous healthcare system. There wasn't enough access. It's way too expensive, certainly in the United States. And it's, it's just completely inaccessible to most people in the world. The optimistic note is that when we get out of this, when we get to the point where people have devices at home, people have access to algorithms that, are doing, that have done machine learning that can do automated analysis, Healthcare will be much more widely available to people. People will be able to access expertise in the form of machines and algorithms and cloud services and things that will be able to monitor them at home. They will be in the comfort of their own home. There will be much wider access. The costs will plummet in terms of being able to get access to things. Just look at what happened with, with cell phones and smartphones in the world. We went from countries that had no wired infrastructure for telephones and now we've got billions of people in the world using smartphones they have a technology that nobody dreamed of 20 years ago in healthcare it's going to be the same thing people are going to have home healthcare technology that nobody dreamed would be possible and they're going to have and just the same way as that telephone access is so widespread in so many countries at such a low cost people are going to have access to low cost healthcare intelligence that cannot be delivered by humans. And on the professional side of it, from the doctor's point of view, so much of what doctors work with today is so basic. It is so simple. There's so much unnecessary care that goes on in terms of doctors having to look at normal patients that don't need to be seen. Our healthcare professionals are going to be able to focus on the things that they really need it for. The people who have got you know, 10, 12, 14 years of training who today are seeing just stuff that just doesn't need them to have seen it. They are way, they, their time is being wasted. What's going to happen is that their skills are going to be used much more efficiently. They're going to see the challenging problems that need really smart people to look at that the machines can't look at. The machines will pre-process the data and there will be much, much wider access to high-quality healthcare in the same way as so many people in, on the planet have access to computing power that was unheard of decades ago. People have computers in their pockets that are more powerful than large corporations had 30 years ago. The smartphone is unbelievable. People are going to have healthcare in 20 years with a sophistication that doesn't even exist at the level, even in the best hospitals. And the best hospitals will be able to focus on much, much bigger problems and much 
and the kind of patients that really need them. So the future of healthcare is going to be fantastic, much lower cost, much wider access. And I'm conscious we've covered a lot of ground today and there's so much value in a lot of things we've talked about here. So for people that would like to explore this topic further, find out more information about everything that we've talked about today, can you point them in the direction of where they can find you online and equally contact your team if they do have any additional questions? Sure. So our website is thinklabs.com. So think as in using your brains, labs as in laboratories or laboratories, depending on which flavor of English you speak. So T-H-I-N-K-L-A-B-S dot com is our website. And if people have specific questions, they can send questions to support at thinklabs.com. I really enjoyed chatting with you today, especially learning more about how doctors and patients are leveraging new technology and the rise of remote medicine. And of course, I'm fascinated by your digital stethoscope there. But more than anything, just a big thank you for taking 30 minutes to sit down with me today and talk about your vision and everything that you're achieving in a post-COVID-19 world. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's been very enjoyable. Wow, what a great conversation there. I loved hearing more about the story behind the digital stethoscope and how it had not changed at all since I think it was 1816 until now with with this digital stethoscope. But I think what I love most about Clive's journey here is how he's dedicated his life to approaching and solving old problems in new ways by leveraging technology. And if that story resonated with you or you've got any other examples like we've heard today, I'd love to hear from you. So as always, email me techblogwriter at outlook.com. My website is techblogwriter.co.uk where you'll find out more information on how you can work with me or even just browse through over 1,260 podcast episodes. But keep those messages coming in because it's the communication with you all listening everywhere in the world, listening across the world that makes this podcast work. It's not just about me and the guests. It's about your opinions and your insights too. And on that note, I'm going to bid you a fond farewell, but I will return again bright and early tomorrow morning and I invite you to join me again. So a big thank you for listening. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Thank you for listening to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast with Neil C. Hughes. Remember, technology works best when it brings people together.